Kevin, you've got the, uh, the, the sort of the beginning of the year uh, mass gathering palooza. I do. Um, before that, I wanted to uh, mention a couple rec things. We are going to have our Easter party on the um, April the 16th, Saturday from 11 to 1, first time in, I guess, three years due to weather and pandemic issues. So we are very, very excited for that. We're going to have Tiny Tea provide the food, something a little bit different to uh, take a little bit of the, let's say, effort off the members. But um, that is our plan, and um, hopefully it will work out well. So again, Saturday, yeah, Saturday, April the 16th from 11 to 1 right here at the, uh, well, the, the egg hunt is at the tot lot, and then the festivities will be in the uh, community center. Um, summer camp, uh, things are in line. I went on the uh, Media Youth website beginning the week of June 20th. Um, each week has a, a different theme, starting with Pirate Week, the first week. So if you are a bur borough resident, it's $150, $15 per week. Non-borough, it's $175 per week. So the borough does subsidize borough members who uh, wish to attend camp. And it runs weekly, with the exception of the week of uh, July 18th to July 25th when there's a basketball camp, but otherwise it runs through uh, the uh, week of August 8th. And uh, so I think there are 10 weeks altogether for summer camp. So you can register through the uh, Media Youth Center uh, website if you'd like to do that. Um, REC did donate to uh, the Friends of Glen Providence Park so they could finance their concert. So thanks to REC for providing that. Um, we did set up some movie nights, um, June the 3rd, July the 9th, and August the 13th, they're tentatively the movie nights, and as you'll see, the uh, um, June the third night lines up with the um, picnic down at the school, what they're calling the um, where is it, the spring fling. So um, we've done that in the past, and hopefully that will work out this year with uh, the weather cooperating. Um, I did mention in the past about the potential of doing a tea party at the uh, bed and breakfast. That's on hold. The members are still discussing that, so we haven't made a, uh, a decision on that. And since I'm on rec agenda, I'm going to skip to the end. Um, for the appointment. So when we meet again for legislative uh, session in two weeks, I will be asking council to approve Kate O'Neill, uh, Susan DeVito, and Brennan Potash as the new members to REC. They've already begun to assist. They're participating. I think they already did a, a little bit of a clean out of the closet getting ready for Easter, so we will be happy to have them aboard and we'll make that official on the, uh, the legislative meeting. So I believe that is off from REC. Um, before I get to the agenda items for public safety, I did want to bring up one um, pretty significant topic that came up in our last meeting, and that is the EMS situation. Um, as you all know, uh, firefighters are, well, volunteer firefighters have become very scarce. Same thing with EMS. So sometime in the near future, we're going to have to make some kind of a decision about potentially hiring EMS for the fire company. Um, we mm. talked earlier about the, uh, the ambulance. Uh, one example was the chief brought up, I guess, during our last meeting that that night they had to have an ambulance call. The ambulance had to come from Concordville to media because there were no other ambulances available. So that is how bad the EMS situation and the paramedic situation has gotten. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. We can put our heads together and, and think about what we could potentially do. But um, in the chief's words, the situation is imploding and it's very difficult to find people willing to volunteer their time or even be paid to do this uh, job. So. Like I said, this is something we're going to have to deal with in the, uh, in the future. Uh, but good news, um, the mural committee, I guess for a better word, um, Karen Tausig Lux, this is the mural that's going to be put on uh, Monroe Street. Um, I don't know if there's a name for it. Joy, do you remember if there's a name for this? I know it's by Squirrels. Oh, yeah. Yeah, squirrels or something. yeah, it was all, it all involved designs with black, gray, and, and uh, white squirrels, but I can't remember what specifically. But anyway, this is the design that the, the committee accepted, and that's what they'll be putting on the street come up. Yeah, yeah it, it, it just represents the black, gray, and white squares. Yeah, I, I don't know if that one media. had a particular title. No, I know some of them did, but, yeah. but that one did. Anyway, I'm not that's sure what, if this one did. <laughs> that's what they'll be putting on, so um, there's that one. Um, all right, so now to the um, agenda items. Uh, I think the way that safety, or public safety decided was Mass gathering permits that we do yearly, we didn't really bring them to the committee to discuss. So item number two, the Media's Farmer's Market, we've approved that yearly, so there's no reason that we won't um, approve that unless anybody has an objection to the Farmer's Market. Um, so we'll approve that in two weeks. Um, the Spring Fling celebration, that has also been done in the past, not obviously for the last few years, but 
That is generally toward the end of the school year. On a Friday evening, they close uh, Edgemont and then have a picnic, usually on Burrell Field. And when possible, we have tied that in with the uh, first movie night. So we are hoping to be able to, to, do, that, uh, to do that this year. Um, the Media Arts Council, Jasper Street Jam, we did approve a um, session similar to this, but I think it was earlier in the summer. So I guess their idea is to, uh, to make that monthly. Is anybody from the MAC? Well, I was just going to share with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I was talking with Liz about it, and they are interested in making it monthly. So I told her that um, she should just <laughs> provide one, the next one, and have all the dates on it. So, right, right. Well, um, but I, she did ask us to move forward this July one, but sh there will be another one coming. We, we, do you remember what was the date of the first one we approved? It was, it was June. A, it was a June. Was it oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I assume if it's the same format, we'll see how the June one goes, and we can bring that to, uh, to public safety after, uh, after that. Um, we did approve the um, Santa Parade that will be at the end of November, November 27th, so I'll be asking the council to approve that when we meet in two weeks. Um, and then finally there's the bid for the um, traffic calming product on Jefferson Street, or project on Jefferson Street. Um, Kevin, can you, I know you, we talked about this at the safety meeting a few weeks ago. Certainly. So uh, back in October and November during the capital planning process, the Public Safety Committee recommended two of the options out of the traffic calming plan. The first one is at North Olive Street. It had to do with an enlargement of some of the facilities up there, including some pavement markings, uh, the enlargement of the uh, island up there, including some landscaping, and then on Jefferson Street. So we did apply for a grant on Jefferson and Lemon that was denied. So we're moving forward with the, the applications along Edgemont, I think Redner. So the budget that we set for that was $50,000. So I'm trying to be very mindful about the dosing of how many of these traffic calming improvements we can get for mm -hmm. that, amount of mon uh, that amount of money. So that's what this is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I, we did have the grant for that. That's what I thought that we had the, the money already designed for that one. That's right. Keep in mind, Jefferson Street isn't, again, e either one of these two projects is, is a long series of projects to help Jefferson Street. From right. my, my entire experience of, of Walking Jefferson Street, talking to the residents out there, including the traffic coming plan, is it's going, it's going to be a long road to right. help facilitate. So again, a any resource we can continue to invest in that area uh, is going to be um, money well spent, in my opinion. The grant that we talked about tonight hopefully will help to nail or drill down into the details, like on Lemon Street, and then the big challenge will be the changes at the eastern side of town at Jefferson by the hotel. And we're, we, we, you know, recommended or TPD recommended that we make the, um, I think it's the right turn only. But these two improvements are quicker things that we can get done. So they're kind of uh, lower hanging fruit to, to say for the traffic. Okay. Program. That was my understanding that it was everything we could do for Jefferson Street and bit by bit. And that's so correct. We'll, right. mm -hmm. um, so I believe that concludes my report. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions for Kevin? Nice morning. Um, uh, Holiday parade. That's now going back to State Street, and not cruising around the town. Um, you can ask our. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. That, I understood it was. <laughs> it was back to the format of the parade as opposed to the Santa stroll. That's what, what my understanding Fantastic. was. Yeah. So yeah. Big big big, ready to see the reindeer again. Any unforeseen? Don't say. It. Don't say. It. Don't say. It. Monica Rohorek, North Lemon Street. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's your problem. <laughs> 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 that the yes, yes. We, they, like, apparently at the meeting it got a little complicated, so they tabled it, but they, it's definitely something in the works. So. Okay. Great. Any, any uh, other questions for Kevin? Peter. I should be quite brief. I just got a couple. Well, I have uh, an announcement, really, and then a request um, from, from the library. Just to remember, the spring book sale is April 23rd and 24th, Saturday and Sunday. It is their largest fundraiser, and it's actually one of the best book sales in the region, mm -hmm. one of the best book sales I've ever been to. Please put it on your calendars. Please bring a cash or a blank check. They have bags, and fill them up. You said the 20th? 23rd and 24th. Okay. If you come on Saturday, I might be taking your money. <laughs> um, 
Shade Tree. The Shade Tree had a meeting this, this just before workshop, and they have a request to council that I said I would convey to all of you. They would like to change the way the sidewalk reimbursement program works now vis-a-vis uh, -vis shade trees. Uh, those of you newer on council, I might get this slightly wrong, but I believe the way it works now that the borough owns trees and media and um, plants them, but homeowners are responsible for their sidewalks. And sometimes the trees that we plant cause the sidewalks to pitch up, in which case we cite the homeowner to fix the sidewalk. Uh, the first time, I believe now it's the homeowner's responsibility, but the second time they have that we pay half? No, the first time it's 50%. What? first time it's 50%, so they can come to us and ask for, you know. First time 50%. 50%. Okay. What, this, what, the, what the Shade Tree Commission would like the borough to consider as a way to incentivize tree planting throughout the borough is that should the borough's tree pitch up the sidewalk, at all that the borough would be willing to pick up all the cost, 100% of the cost each time. That's the proposal, but they want, the, I said, I don't know what committee that might land in to Paul's point before, the <laughs> matrix, right? It could be uh, the community development committee because you consider zoning matters and those sorts of things, uh, but pub public trees are also public property. Uh, one of the most important public properties, the most important linear park we have in town is our street system. So where does it land? I don't know. We as a council should decide, maybe you, Mr. Hall, could decide, President Hall could decide where you want to at least park it for now, but eventually it's going to probably end up in the finance committee too because there will be a financial implication, though I don't think it's huge. But So that's my request from them via all of us, to all of us. How would that have to happen? I mean, uh, basically, I mean, what would happen, the committee would consider the implications pro or con of changing it and make a recommendation to the rest of us okay. about what to do. Did they discuss, Peter, at all the size? I mean, is, it, you know, is a resident going to come and go, this tree made nine of my slabs bail up and they only have ten slabs on their entire property? You know, or is there something that's like, do you know enough that this yeah. tree root's only going to go X and could only affect That's X a very good point, and I forget, neglected to say something important about what they discussed, and that was they felt that if this could happen if conditions were met. In other words, the conditions that the borough would want, conditions that have plagued the Shade Tree Commission for years. For instance, contractors cutting all the tree roots when they put in a sidewalk, right? You get 100% if you get an inspection prior to construction. You know, you know, the, somebody from code enforcement comes out and says, oh, you didn't cut down all the tree roots, right? Therefore, you get all the money. Or you, you used a reputable contractor, therefore, you get all the money. In other words, there could be conditions imposed on that 100%. To your point, no more than three blocks, something like that, right? Somebody's got to develop the, the regulations. They want to... They're just asking council, somebody please do it for us, consider it for us, or not. That's it. Not a bad idea. You know, if we end up reimbursing a bad job ongoing, you know, it might be best if we take that bull by the horns and find an alternative to just throwing down concrete. So, uh, I'm 100% behind it, by the way. I think our street trees are a very important resource, and I think we should do everything we can to make sure they thrive and don't get all their roots cut because somebody's saving money on a sidewalk. Yeah? I actually saw a, and I don't know if it's temporary or not, but it was in front of a very, very, very big sycamore. Uh, and they laid asphalt. And I kind of went, gee, I wonder if that's temporary because it actually makes pretty good sense because asphalt has a lot more give and take mm -hmm. than concrete. It's like, well, if they did it a little bit more attractive, maybe that's an alternative. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But maybe there are the things that we could take that responsibility for over the, over the property. Area. Peter, if I may, I just wanted to share that staff has been having the, a lot of these conversations um, around what could those conditions be. Just like you said, different materials, going around tree roots, you know, what, whatever that may be. Um, so if and we, 
some of those conversations have a pause for a little bit, <laughs> but if you guys would let us know in terms of what committee, I mean, this, I think we can pick this up again, because we were having both EAC involved, um, we were having Amy and Paul there listening into some of them, we had Shade Tree, we had, you know, all of our environmental and public works people talking about this kind of tree sidewalk, um, you know, balance, so. This does kind of fit exactly what we're talking about tonight with the meetings, because I mean, I, I see Where does it CDC, go? CDC is, yeah, we, permits, yeah, right, things right. of that nature, but then I see EAC or Shade Tree telling us what the best type of materials would be. So it's a whole idea of it. It might end up at two or three committees before it gets, gets finalized, but we, each committee has their expertise. So we're going to know in the CDC about what we need to do to either permit or not permit. Shade tree is going to be the best ones qualified. You say this is the type of materials that we should use, type of situation. So have fun, Brian. <laughs> I mean, can't can't we sort of acknowledge that there's some cross functionality to what we do? Yeah. Like I'm thinking about, you know, Mark from an EAC perspective and myself from an MBA perspective has been up. partnering <laughs> on a yeah. plastic bag ordinance ban, whatever you want to call it, for months now right. so that we can, you know, meet our shared goals. I think we can say that EAC is leading that, but certainly MBA has committed a lot of time and resources as well. So do we have like a primary and a secondary versus like a full owner? Are we over architecting this? <laughs> should, we just, should we just assign it to a committee and but stop talking about it? Just wait till my report. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can all do it at the same time. Yeah. So he, here, here's, here's my thought. I mean, and it doesn't... It, it doesn't need to end up in the same committee it started in. Um, right. But the, I think the person who has been most directly involved, regularly involved in sidewalk issues, even to the point that he put together sort of a map of our sidewalks, is Jim Jeffrey. And so that argues to me that uh, perhaps we start off in the CDC and get his thoughts, and then we might decide at that point we're out of our depth and it needs to go someplace else. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, but uh, I, I think that that could be, it's as good a, as, as good a starting place as any. I don't disagree. Because yep. you know, then we at least know what the public quantity safe. is. No, yes, you know, and it uh, I don't touch it. And no one can know the history behind this more uh, better than he. At this, but at the same time, Shane Tree could sit there and start to discuss materials. Right. So we don't do three months at CDC and then three months at, you know, as you were right, right, just referencing, so this doesn't go on forever. We can do more than one thing at one time, I think, in government. So there's no reason we can't look at the areas and how we're going to manage it at the same time Shade Tree comes up with these are the materials or suggestions that they have to ensure that we don't whack a tree. Yeah, we can, we can walk a dog and smoke a cigar at the same time. Uh. Sometimes. <laughs> um, but the, and if, if Jim is uncomfortable with it, he can let us know at the first CDC and say, I, I think he's that not, this he's needs to be He's not uncomfortable with it. He's been involved in those staff there conversations. Go. Okay. Perfect. All right, there we go. That concludes my report. Any questions for Peter? Mark. Thank you, uh, President Hall. Again, I want to follow up. Liz was a perfect segue. Uh, earlier this week, there was a focus group, the EAC and MBA. Uh, you know, the EAC, uh, one of the EAC members led it, and it was a pretty remarkably open conversation about the single-use plastic ban slash ordinance slash straw slash whatever we want to call it eventually. We don't know. We think the term ban is going to go the way of the dinosaurs. Um, it was quite productive listening to local businesses, and I really want to thank Dave Fairman and Liz Romaine for helping to put that together for us, because, you know, prior to my joining council, it was something council requested um, before proceeding with this plastic bag, single-use plastic ordinance. Um, there is going to be another meeting on the 18th with business owners, uh, and we want to invite any interested parties to attend that as well. Uh, that's going to be more of an open forum where we're going to hopefully have someone uh, from the business community leading it and asking questions and, and moderating it from that perspective so that when we bring the ordinance to uh, the solicitor in May, we'll have a lot of feedback for the solicitor to input uh, in, in, in how that's going to work and what that will look like. So that's where that stands. I don't want to get into any of the weeds because we'll have plenty of time for that next month. Um, one of the ideas that, uh, again, cross-council 
ideas. Uh, Councilwoman Washington reached out and asked to me a, uh, about something involving uh, a concept called a day without a car, which was brought to EAC at the last meeting and was unanimously uh, mm -hmm. approved. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be an opportunity to highlight public transportation in our area, highlight places to visit one can reach without a vehicle. We even talked about featuring individual uh, experiences in the newsletter, things like that. That's at the very early stages. We talked to, uh, to Brittany Foreman, who gave us some fabulous connections that we'll try to work on to help build that. But I want to thank Councilwoman Washington as well. Um, B City Resolution is my one piece of business that will be coming up. We have a draft resolution that will be updated for Media Borough as well. Um, please make sure, you know, if you take a look at that, we'll be voting on that. I do need to let everyone know I will not be here for the legislative meetings, so I will be asking someone to, to bring that to, to vote. Now we get to the part of my agenda that really is not related to the EAC, and I just want to give a little bit of a background here. Um, you know, public comment privilege of the floor is something that Media Borough takes seriously. No way do we want to deny anybody their right to speak. I want to say that up front. We value your opinion. Um, indeed, we allow people who don't live in the borough to speak. Uh, that's not the case everywhere. Uh, and we give two opportunities for members of the public to speak to council. We listen, we appreciate it, and we want people to exhibit their First Amendment rights to engage with us. It's, it's how good government works. During a workshop that uh, Councilwoman uh, Washington and Councilwoman Romaine and I attended, it was mentioned that many municipalities in the, uh, in the Commonwealth considered a best practice to adopt guidelines for their public comment portion of the meetings. They print that right on their agendas. So there's no question about what the expectations are from the public or from the council. Uh, and it, it can look like anything that we want it to look like. And it's something that we would certainly take into consideration. All I'm asking um, is for council to take a look at the two examples that I've provided. One of them comes from Rose Tree Media School Board. It's a little stricter than most that I've seen. Uh, there's one from the school, uh, the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs itself. It's from Indiana County, a small town. Uh, they're both in the Dropbox under the EAC folder. We really didn't know a better place to put them. Again, we're back to that whole theme of the <laughs> night. Um, but I want to make it extremely clear to everyone in here that in no way do I wish to discourage public comment, and it's quite the opposite. I want as many voices as possible heard. Uh, I want decorum to reign in our meetings. What I'm recommending is we look at the possibility of some simple rules for the public comment period so it doesn't get out of hand, turning into a shouting match. I'm sure we've all seen some of those uh, videos. Uh, not that it would happen now, but who knows what's coming down the road. Um, this is as much for the new members of council as it would be for anybody in the future, and it would also help the public and keep peace uh, should controversial issues arise down the road. And that's really all that this is for me. There's no agenda to get this uh, passed. It's more of an open conversation about it. And it's something that we can look at to, again, uh, take a few months, look at it, and then come up with thoughts for it. It was just something that was presented. And I thought, hmm, you know, at the moment, we don't really have any, you know, regulations or rules around our public comment. So that's not a license for the next few moments. But that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any questions for Mark? All right, so we have a uh, public comment and privilege of the floor, our uh, second burst of that this evening. Yes, Brian. Hi, Brian Simmons, 309 Astor Square. Just wanted to add to Peter's comment. The book sale also is Monday the 25th. I'm sorry, yes, yes, the, the bag sale. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yes, please. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Rita Jordan Keller. And I live at 311 South Avenue in Media. And it's really good to see everyone here, to see members of the Borough Council and Mr. Mayor. It's always good to see you. And uh, I have to echo my good old sidekick, uh, Paul, there, that uh, I actually took down a couple of your quotes. And uh, we go way back, really way back, <laughs> really way back. Um, so I guess I'm one of those true old-time media individuals that you mentioned tonight. You did say that. You do say some really good stuff sometimes, Paul, every, one, every once in a while. And uh, I really, really, I really like that. And I do consider myself one of those true old-time media individuals. I've been here, God, 
50 years. It's a flash. It just goes by so quickly. But when you live in a town like media, it's glorious. I love media. I can't say that enough, and people who know me know that about me. Um, I've shared this with some of my friends from Keep Media Green and my running community and wherever else I go, that one of the best times I have in media is I walk around at dusk with my dog now, who caused me to fracture my ankle, which is getting better, and I just am filled with gratitude absolutely filled with gratitude and how I got to be in such an incredible place like media. I taught for almost 30 years as a social studies teacher, so a little aside, um, I was voted the teacher that most digresses, <laughs> so I told my, my buddy Mike that he can drag me away from the microphone anytime. So Mark, that two-minute thing, just forget it right now. Would you have a hug? I figured you would. I figured you would. So I think what I want to just share, just for a moment or two, not very long, and Mike, you, you have the job now, pull me off, is that some of the magic and some of the beautiful moments of media was in the 70s when I came here. And for those of you who do go way back, and I know some of you do, that we were changing the town. And the community, the people, were changing the town. We were interracial, we were diverse, we had all ages, and hell or high water, we changed the political landscape of this town through our hard work, in coming together as people. And that's the magic of this town. It's, it's people. These people here tonight, you folks here tonight, as a social studies teacher, this is democracy to me. I've always told my students, my kids, as I called them, that democracy is not a spectator sport. And you, Mark, I'm so proud of you. You did your homework tonight. You really did. I was really blown away. I disagreed with you, that's okay. but that's okay. It's not, it's a, not a spectator sport. It's participation. And that's why we're here. And that's why some of my, well, all of the members of Keep Media Green, which I am a member, because I love this town. I love the environment. I love the people. Yes, Joy, we do need affordable housing. And that's one of the many things that I am for, too, and that I've, so many of us, we, we cross-section everything. We're, we're intergenerational and just want the best. Without me going on too far here, I just, Paul, I'm coming back to you. It's a, it's a circle. I think it's been raised before, but my looking at you guys tonight, you're talking so much at each other, you really need to talk with each other. And Paul, you mentioned when you guys were talking about committees, why don't you form a subcommittee of the, some of the me people in Keep Media Green to talk with you about it? I do, Peter, you were one of my heroes, and you still are to some degree. You're kind of losing ground a little bit, all right? But I remember you trucking around this town with your flowers and planting bushes, and I just said, wow, this is great. You know, just make take. My students, when they would say to me, Mrs. JK, where do you live? You know what I would tell them? I would say to them, I live in paradise. I did 50 years ago, I still do today, and I want to keep that paradise for my kids and for my grandkids. And I think that's why we, we are here. I think that's why we were at Centennial Woods. I think that's why we're down at the swim club. I think that's why we continue to fight for everything that we consider to be magical and beautiful about media. And that's why I'm here tonight, to 
reconsider your thoughts. I know some of you may be a little on shaky ground about how you feel about a voter referendum, but talk with each other. Talk with anybody in Keep Media Green. Let's work this out. Let's collaborate instead of missing each other. The media I knew in the 70s, and even a little bit into the 80s, we went at each other. We met with each other, whether it was here or in a bar. <laughs> mostly in the bars, all right? But we knew each other, we, we may have disagreed, but we trust each other, we respect our differences, and we move forward, giving a little, getting a lot. So that's really all I wanted to say to you folks tonight. I love media, I want to keep it the paradise that I know it to be, and really reconsider the voter referendum. We elected you. Representation is a two-way street, my friends. It's a two-way street. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rita. Anybody else wish to come to the microphone? Tell us who you are, where you live, and what's on your mind. Hi, Linda Emery, 345 West Second. Um, I, I heard tonight uh, folks feeling as though this isn't the right time for this. And in fact, the legislation which authorizes municipalities to do just this has been in place since 1967, over a half a century. And the fact that media maybe hasn't used that authority the way it could have meant that we lost precious land. Yeah, it's scarce. And it costs more now. But it's not going to cost less in 10 years. A referendum is a wonderful way to involve the taxpayers. It's our land. And an informed electorate is not your enemy. This is a wonderful opportunity for a partnership that will take us into the 21st century the way that we need to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila Fox and I live at 475 Linden Lane and I did take some notes but um, I have a long history of being a media resident. Uh, I was married to Barry Sherwin, we was, was on council for 20 years so I have some insight into the processes here uh, and I just do feel like I have some street credibility. Also, I'm a Philly girl and I'm not as Me too. as others. I'm just, you know, I, I, I was very involved in Philadelphia politics and we were not nice to each other. I, uh, and uh, so I, I want to begin by saying that I'll be as, as, uh, I'll be as uh, reserved as I can be, uh, given the, what Mark just said. That was very controlling, what you just, what you talked about, about the rules and regulations. That's my opinion. Okay, um, this country has a long-standing history of activism, and as, as Linda talked, uh, this borough has a long-standing history of activism. And Peter, to t and you guys, to tell us that you know better than we do because we elected you, that is an insult. That's so paternalistic. We, have, um, we are very bright people, very experienced people. You're entitled to your opinion, but we certainly are entitled to ours. We've earned our entitlement. So I just, let me see a few more things. Uh, okay. Uh, um, I just want to tell you this, I'm very disappointed in you. I really am because it seems to me that uh, you become a real, I mean, you, you, you're decent people, you do a good job, but you become bureaucrats. Uh, 
and uh, without passion. And uh, one more thing, we ain't going nowhere. You can tell us that you don't want us to have a referendum, uh, I, I, but that doesn't mean we're going anywhere. So I'm not, uh, I don't know if this behavior is ill-conceived Ill or whatever, I'm not, um, I'm not going to be polite because I'm very disappointed as a, long, as a, as a uh, media resident for tw almost 30 years and come back. My son lives in Drexel Hill. We have a gl global climate catastrophe. And uh, I, I just feel very bad about who you are now. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, please, come forward. Uh, my name is Hank Emerson, and I live on West Jefferson Street. And um, I want to say that I see you all in a different light. Before I came, I just wasn't sure whether there was a meeting point between the group I'm part of, which is Keep Media Green, and all of you. And after listening to you tonight, I actually think we do have a meeting point. What you've said is that you care about open space, and you've said that almost to a person. And I believe you. So I think there is a meeting point between you between us. Secondly, I'm not standing in front of you as someone who thinks I know what the best method to do, to do it is. Maybe I don't. I'm new to this. I guess my concern would be what, what I've heard, and I hope I'm understanding it somewhat, is that you believe that borrowing money to preserve open space would be a better method, and to do it as it's actually needed rather than the referendum. I'm open to that idea. My concern would be, as a council in a town that's changing, and sometimes seems like it's changing rapidly, and the makeup of this council will change, I'm wondering how I would know that you are committed to the method that you tell us you support tonight. How do we know that you're committed to that over time? That, that would be my concern. But I'm. I'm glad that I came tonight, and I appreciate the care you thought over what we said. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I, I don't know if anybody has any. Uh, I, what I can tell you, Mr. Emerson, is this: that uh, we have a long history in media of, of doing exactly that, of uh, of following through on our plans, and making sure that uh, when we need money, we've we've always been willing to invest in this town. We have always been, if, if there is a, a secret to Media Borough, it's because we, it, it's that we have this wonderful community and you've had elected officials who have been willing to invest in the town. And I think to a person here, we all recognize that this is an investment in our town. So uh, I, I think that my, my response to your question is there is a track record here. And I want to say thank you for finding that common ground because it is there. Um, I, you know, as I said, I did a lot of research into this. I did a lot of things. We did come to a different conclusion um, than you. I'm on a board making this decision and I understand where you're coming from. I agree with what you're looking to do. But again, it's the method that we follow to get there. And as I said back in January, it's a matter of trust. Um, we trust that we will hear from you and I appreciate hearing from you, you know that. Uh, I just ask that you trust us. Thank you. Sir. My name is Barry Halk and I live at 414 South Olive Street. Um, I do believe that um, we as a, as a society are in denial about this climate crisis that we're in. and. Uh, I think that um, it's not unrealistic or overly dramatic to paint a picture of what's beginning to happen now with um, species going away, rising tide waters, food shortages, extreme temperature, extreme weather things. It's just going to be, I mean, you could paint a very bleak picture of the future. We've waited a long time. A lot of those things are things we can't really do anything about. They take, you know, national 
governments to, to deal with those things. There are things we can do. Saving trees in this town is one of them. And I understand that you are committed. We have to figure out a way to not let any more of these Centennial Woods disappear. We, that's, what, that's one of the things that we as a borough have a responsibility to do and must do. We have to figure out a way to do it. I've lived in communities where, like media, we've become, that have become too good for their own good. They've become highly desirable, um, and, and that's what may, brought me to media, because I got, like Joy, I got priced out of my old neighborhood. I was renting and I couldn't, and I sunk roots there, I raised my kids there, I knew all the store owners, but I couldn't, when it came time, I could not buy a house there. I came to media at the right time during the economic depression of 2008. My wife and I were able to buy a house. We love it here, but I see that happening here too. So I am concerned about that. That's a, that's a, I, and I, it's, and diversity is extraordinarily important to me. And we're losing that here. So I understand those concerns, and I don't know what the answers are. I, I know a five-year loan might not be the answer, but a longer term loan, I don't, I, I, I understand the issues about raising taxes on working folks in this town, and that we're not as wealthy a town as the people in West Town or wherever. But we have to figure out a way to not lose any more trees. That is our responsibility. And, you know, the millions that you say we have in the bank, the great credit we have, did not help us last year with Centennial Woods. So that, to me, doesn't hold water. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halkin. Yes, please. Michael's Michael Straw, 499 West Jefferson Street, Apartment 507, Media. Um, before I came here tonight, I actually um, was at a party event, as you can see. I'm adorning a Republican Party elephant um, tie. Um, I considered actually taking it off before I came in here, but I'm actually very proud now to wear it. I wear it proudly just as any individual that is a Democrat would wear their tie with a Democratic donkey on it. Because one of the things that unites us as Americans is the right to freedom of speech and the right to the First Amendment. And I'm proud to be who I am just as any Democrat or Independent is proud to be who they are. And I am concerned by what I'm hearing um, in regards to possibly changing um, the comments and privilege of the floor. I think that it's very controlling. I have been to school board meetings in the past. I've seen the two to three minute window period of time. I think it's very controlling and I think it's very, I, I think you're, you're giving the wrong message when you're saying you want to listen to us and you want to hear us when you give us a time limit. I think that there are ways that you can look at it um, from not repeating the same speaker, maybe, in terms, of, um, in terms of the issue. You might be able to look at it that way. I, I disagree to a degree on that as well, but I can see that argument. I cannot see putting a time limit on, because I think that it's very important that, as we saw with speakers earlier today, that passion, sometimes it takes five or ten minutes to speak, and say everything that's important for the council to hear. You are our elected officials, regardless of party. You should be able to sit here in your meeting, as you are elected to do, and listen to what we have to say. Because sometimes an issue is not going to take one minute or two minutes or three minutes to say, and sometimes an issue is going to be more convoluted than that period of time. So I think that instead of limiting our speech, you should be embracing it as you are right now. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. If I could respond to that, please. Um, sure, please. Nowhere um, have I asked for a time limit. Nowhere have I asked for anything other than a conversation. This is not intended in any way to limit what you say or how you say it. All it's intended to do is to set it up so that there's a standard here. That's it. That's, but that's, that's what it. a time limit does. A time limit Again, is a set Again, there is time. no time limit being that was what, discussed. That was one of two examples that you brought up. 
and that is I a did. standard. And so that's what I'm, that is what I'm mentioning. You don't have to be upset about that. I'm not upset. You didn't, I, you you did didn't not have to mention it, what, and then I can, on here, but Michael. now, all, I think well, that, my I, speech I think to be able to get up and say it. I appreciate your point. Here's I, one of I those arguments that you just mentioned you didn't want to have, but you decided well, no, I, to push I back on me. I'm not pushing back on you. Yes, you did. You just I'm did. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Have a lovely night, gentlemen, sir. let's let's yeah, do, let's I'm through. I think I, that we've reached I the end of this. I said what I said. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, Wait, Michael, can I ask you a question? Why don't Republicans want people to vote? Because you're talking about like freedom of speech. Why is it the the overall arching thing of Republicans to keep people from voting? I was just curious about that. Why? That's really interesting. Considering I vote by mail. Many people vote okay, by well, mail. But I'm saying Republicans in general are trying to suppress the vote. Don't you agree with that? No. Okay. I don't need to, I, because, I mean, if you want to represent the Democratic Party, go right ahead. I, res I mean, that's, that is on you right now. Okay, You're just, arguing with curious. somebody because of, about defending freedom of speech and the First Amendment, something that gives you the right to say what you're saying to me right now and me the right to respond to you. So that's it. I mean, if you want to argue with me. No, I'm not arguing. I just had a question. You All can right. ask me off, offline. Okay, okay. All right. Why don't we, uh, our next customer. Interesting conversation. Terry Rumsey, 342 West 4th Street here in media. You know, Joe Biden said, don't, don't tell me about your values. Show me your budget. I'll show you your values. Talk is cheap. It all comes down to how much is in the budget for open space. The, the four incumbents who came on before Mark, Liz, and Joy voted to approve a open space plan that said we were going to invest three to ten million dollars over the next three years in the acquisition and protection of open space. Brian actually questioned that timeline and that amount, but he was overruled and 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 all four of you voted for that, of course, immediately, but we don't really need to honor it. So, I mean, in terms of the voting is the, the absolute core of what democracy is, and I wanted to address what you said, Liz. If the voters of media turn down the open space referendum, then that's democracy. They're, they're speaking and they're telling you. What we're saying is, let us vote. But what I think the council really is afraid of is that the voters of media would overwhelmingly approve a referendum to borrow three to ten million dollars and fund open space. That's the real concern. Not that they'll not, um, vote against it, but that they'll vote for it. Peter said, you know, we're the elected officials. Uh, the people of media voted to represent us, but we also voted for the Pennsylvania legislature who said there's three things that um, local communities can hold referendums for. Fire safety, library services, and open space acquisition. We've invested millions of dollars in the library system and the fire safety system. Over the past several years, there's one outlier, and that's the green infrastructure. Like Biden said, you know, don't tell me about your values, show me your budget. In the end, the open space plan says we want to save the remaining 23 acres of open space in Media Borough. Mark, you talked about, you know, the, the differences in communities, obviously. Land in Utah is more expensive than in New York City, but open space is just as important in New York City as, as Utah. Everything is relative. So while land in media is more expensive, there's less of it. So, so there's, the investment level is going to be um, different th in different communities. But we might pay more, but we don't have to save as much. So that's what I would say to, to your analysis on that. Um, it's clear this council doesn't want to do a voter referendum. In the end, you're going to be judged on did you save the 23 acres or not. And that's what the people of media will um, judge you on. 
we want to put wind behind your sail, but we also want to have our voice. Kevin, it's ironic you're talking about suppressing voters while, while you know, not letting us vote on open space. So just be careful about how you accuse others and take a look in the mirror here. Um, you have the power. I wish the legislature allowed us to go out and gather a certain number of signatures and force a referendum on the ballot. They didn't do that. They put the, the, that power in the hands of the local council. We believe that the people of media want to vote on open space preservation and protection and that they would overwhelmingly vote to do it. You don't want them to vote. You don't want us to vote. That's your right. But we're going to continue knocking on doors, talking to the voters of media, sending you the postcards, signs going up all over the town. In the end, you will be judged on how much of the open space you save or you don't. Let's talk about trust in the Centennial Woods. Last year we were told we can't purchase this unbelievably valuable ecological space because we don't have money in the budget. Now we're being told we can't put money in the budget that will hamper us from um, purchasing open space. We came to you with a plan that would have totally covered the cost of purchasing the Centennial Woods. There was a willing seller. What there wasn't was a willing buyer. In terms of trust, you have to earn trust. And, you know, that's what elections are about. And um, ultimately, that's where the voters and media will have their say. We're going to keep pushing you to hold a voter referendum. You might say a thousand people want it, not good enough. Give me two thousand, give me three thousand. And I appreciate your, your ironic looks, Peter, because it is ironic that you're a conservationist who doesn't want to do eminent domain, doesn't want to do conservation easements, doesn't want to use zoning, doesn't want voter referendum. It's not ironic. I it's, would like you to stop listing this as I'm, excuse things me, it is as my turn I'm to speak. thinking these things, it Terry, because I am not. I'm simply listening to you politely. Don't put thoughts in my it's mind. It's my turn Thank to you. speak. No eminent domain, no conservation easement. All this stuff is on public record. No voter referendum. Don't use voting to save the Brumels, I mean zoning to save Brumels track. There is a record here. But I'll just end by saying, let us vote on open space. Give us the vote. Mr. Shamlian. Hi. Um, Fred Shamlian, 105 West 3rd Street. Um, I'd just like to address some of the specific points that were made tonight. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of fundamental truth in the idea that there are impracticalities in, you know, securing a very large loan. You may end up paying more for the land. You may end up paying more to fund this. Um, it is conceivable that the money might not get spent, and then that could create issues. These are all points well worth taking, and I appreciate some of the deeper points that have been explained to me by some members of the council regarding the the fiscal responsibility of the council to meet the greater good and purchasing a property at an inflated price is not necessarily the best choice for the community. So I just want to acknowledge that because that's important. But if, if our thoughts stop there, then all we're doing is saying, okay, we can't. And our job is to solve this, as Terry was saying. Our job is to save the land, save the trees, and retain the character of this town. I, I think the most fundamental change I've seen is, is Front and Lemon. Uh, those two plastic monsters sitting there in that neighborhood are so out of place, and they're allowed to do that. So what does this tell us? Well, first, I mean, should there be a referendum if the point about the finances is true? Absolutely. Why? And not necessarily because we should go out and get a three to ten million dollar loan. I think the first thing this represents is 
I don't think most of the members of, of media see it the way you do. They're not looking at, well, is this a question of fiscal responsibility? Do we really want to deal with this? I think it's just a matter of, do we care enough about trees? Are we all going to vote and say, yeah, let's save the trees? I, I think it's a passion question. I think it's a question where a question like this is designed to generate interest, uh, provide education, provoke thought. And, and give us a sense that we have some ability to self-actualize what we want our town to be like. So I, I think the vote is very valuable and it's a question of perception of what its goal really is. If you had everybody in media going out and saying, yeah, this is really important to us, that would be huge. Even if there were a lot of financial issues after that, simply that fact, I mean, 600 members of, of Keep Media Green have already said that, but I mean, it's great to have all 4,900 members of media say it as well. Um, it was mentioned that there might be a certain anti-development element among those folks who are saying, you know, don't cut down the trees, that means no more development. Um, I think what we're asking for is the kind of development that we consider responsible to our vision for what we'd like this town to be like. And it seems to me, as discussed at the last meeting that I, I was here, is that what we really need to do is figure out how that happens. And I think a lot of us understand what needs to be done, but as in meetings I've had recently with, with, with groups in town that are, you know, civic groups, the idea is where do you get the resources to do this? I mean, right now, if there was a team out there researching what are all the ordinances that are out there today that we might benefit from to help protect us from, you know, front and lemon. Um, what are the zoning laws that we need to be dealing with? Are there possible changes that we could make? What are the laws of the county or the state that, that, that we might want to, to look at carefully? Uh, what are the possibility of using easements more effectively perhaps than we're doing? And I think the idea of an audit, I think that's brilliant. I mean, to audit all the programs that are in that massive document there and saying, are we fulfilling our promises? So I think fundamentally what we need to do is, is step back from the small points and the compartmentalization of this is right, this is wrong, this is right, and, and just saying, how are we going to get this done? Um, the last point I want to make is um, it was said, well, you know, this, this is a, a loan that we're going to need and we're going to have to maintain it for a long time. But I think the point that, that Terry and Robin have made so well and as so many others have voiced is that there's a great sense of urgency. Um, in, in my experience at Third and Olive, the transformation within three or four blocks of my building that are happening like so quickly now, this is an urgent need. I mean, if we want a, a crown for media, a crown of, of, of trees, if we want the greenery that, that people have come here for, or at least one of the reasons that people have come here for, then, then we really need to understand the urgency. Once again, we need to communicate that not just as individuals and not just as a borough council, but all of us together to the larger population that isn't sitting here and maybe too busy to ever attend a meeting like this and say, hey, here's what's going on, here's what's really important, here's how we have to do this. So I would just like to encourage us to, A, recognize the fiscal points you've made because I think they're really valid and I appreciate your sense of thrift and financial responsibility. But I think the largest point by far is not just to say no, but to figure out how we're going to get to yes. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council now? Yes, please. Come forward. Um, Bob Gallagher, and I'm from over on uh, 504 Parks Edge Lane. And uh, I listen to everybody tonight, and, and I do not doubt your commitment to trying to fulfill the open space plan or a lot, a lot of the open space and recreation plans we have uh, you know for the township and I and I do not doubt your sincerity my, my concern is that you know we have portions of open space right now that are completely unprotected and you know my question is what do we do right now what do we do tomorrow if a developer comes in and says, well, I have a deal with Brumo Lake Swim Club, and we're going to develop that property tomorrow, what do we do? We've lost 60 or 70 percent of our open space. If we don't get the loan now, if we don't have the money now, we can't even counter their offer. What can we possibly do as a township? I mean, you, I, I don't doubt your sincerity. I don't doubt it. But I feel like we're unprotected. 
There's nothing to prevent someone else from coming in and taking that property and putting up whatever they'd like to put up. If, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sort of, that's a question. It's not, it's not, I'm not preaching to anybody. If anybody Can could I say, answer that. Yeah. Just, to, just from a technical point of view, yeah. um, having a, having the referendum is not necessarily uh, uh, necessary to having a agreement of sale with any private property owner. You mentioned Brumall Lake Swim Club. Just use them as an example. But it's just it, because it's sort of the crown yeah, jewel. I, 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 get, I, I get why you would use it, particularly yeah. where, where you live. Um, but, you know, having an ongoing relationship with the property owner allows you to ha make an offer at the appropriate time and, and um, at an appropriate price. Uh, what is a disadvantage to a municipality that's interested in a particular piece of open space right. is to not be discussing that with the property owner from the point they're interested. That's important to do because then the situation you describe will not happen when the parties are working in good faith, just as an example. So the referendum in this case is not required. What's required is the relationship and the ability to borrow at the appropriate time should an agreement, you know, be realized. So I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, my question was how do we protect against that? If a developer comes in, they make an offer, they have an agreement with the Bruno Lake Swim Club. How are we really protected against that? You're not protect. Uh, the borough would not be protected in the case of a, a private developer having a pre-existing agreement. Um, to co th th this is a private property rights state. Private property owners have the right to negotiate with other parties to sell or buy their property. I so mean, that could happen in May. It could happen in September next year. It could happen in 2003, right? It could. It, unless, unless the council is proactive about some way to protect that, that can happen. I think that's what I was just describing to you, that when they're proactive, that, that, that can be, st I mean, development can be stopped because presume, unless the parties don't agree, like for instance, so, a municipality and a private property owner talk for a while about, you know, a conservation deal. They ultimately don't come to an agreement. That property owner can then go and sell to somebody else. That happens sometimes in these cases. Sometimes it's just not, there's not reasonable expectations well, on I, either I side. Think, I think in this environment, you have a lot of property developers that are going to any place that has open space, trying to buy that property. Absolutely. They're, they're active right now. They're Absolutely. very active right now. And I'm sure they're active in our community. Yeah. So really, I'm, I'm sort of m messing it. Peter, are you the one doing the talking with Strington Lake and, or uh, Brumall Lake and making sure that we don't have someone buy that property out from under the township? I'm going to... Or who is? Uh, those are conversations yeah, I that can't... can't. I can't. Oh, oh, they're... They're, they're, they're okay. private. They no, can't. Right. That's right. not true. That yes, sir, it is. You have the privilege to hold it back. There's nothing to say. Our that. solicitor has advised us repeatedly not to engage those types of discussions in public. It's okay. not illegal. Our solicitor, who is a... Who is well experienced has right. sorry, Mr. Rumsey. All right, Mr. Gallagher. Well, so no, I understand. You know, so there's there's things happening behind the curtain that we don't know about that may help us protect that. Yeah, the um, Pennsylvania legislature, just FYI for you, carves out a couple of things that borough councils at their discretion could discuss in private by yeah. the nature of their sensitivity. Yeah. One is real estate negotiation, real, real estate negotiations, negotiation, and others right. personnel matters. Okay. And, that's right. Well, that's great, and I, I, I appreciate the commitment I've heard tonight, and I do not doubt your sincerity um, and the opportunity you would have to, to, do, to say that would be, would be a great thing, I think. I think uh, it would be a great achievement for you as council. Um, Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Mr. President, sorry to interrupt. Do you mind if I excuse myself? Unless there's any other technical matters. Again, this 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 discussion is important, and I respect all the voices, but it really has nothing to do with engineering at this point. I don't anticipate that there'll be any further call for your. Is there any need for uh, professional advice tonight? Te technical advice in executive session. Any other matters that? I don't projects? believe that we have any executive it's session. Okay. I, I mean that respectfully. It's just I, I'm not adding anything to this. I'm still on the clock. Robin Lazarson, 342 West 4th Street. To Bob's point about immediate protection of Brumos Lake Country Club,
for a short time uh, due to municipal action, that property was protected because of the initiative to rezone it to, uh, to Merck, Municipal Educational Recreational Community. Uh, the protection was removed after a deal was struck to rescind that ordinance, but that is, of course, the most efficient path toward uh, you know, mitigating against the risk that you're talking about, which is imminent. Um, and you know, while a negotiated solution through a long-term relationship building thing you know, would be ideal, immediately moving to rezone it would at least halt the possibility of a development plan you know, being submitted, after which point it would be too late. But you know, again, I've not sensed any appetite for doing that. And then again, that calls into question you know, the, 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 the commitment and the sincerity that you are trying to put forward and I, I'm not impugning that, but I'm just saying there's a way to do that. There's a way to, to, to solve the problem of protecting the crown jewel and it has not been taken. Does anyone else wish to address council at this time? Yes, Mr. President. Mr. Martin, please. I sure do, Mr. President, because this has been one fascinating meeting. <laughs> I will tell you that and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the heck out of it. First off, the thing about the uh, uh, having a few, excuse me, Bill Martin, two or three East Front Street. The thing about having the uh, guidelines is a great idea, and I want to pick up on that and piggyback on that because in Lower Marion, for the zoning hearing board, they have a set of guidelines for the for the citizens who are coming in here. I've been on zoning for 20 years or more, and I serve at the pleasure of Borough Council. Thank you very much, but. We don't have a set of guidelines like that, and that would be handy because we have a little preamble that we do be prior, and we're very respectful of the citizens when they come in, the borough residents when they come in, they can be represented or unrepresented. We, we do every, you know, we, we bring them in, on and, and coach them through the process and such. But Lower Marion has that process. If we could take a note and make that, uh, that uh, set of guidelines available for the zoning hearing board, I, th I think that would be great. Secondly, the sidewalk thing, I happen to have had a close relationship with an elderly neighbor. She's passed away. She had difficulty with borough trees. And in fact, in fact, she may have been the impetus for the 50% deal because prior to that, it was 100% all, on the, all on, the, on the borough resident who said, wait a minute, that's your tree and it's me. You know, I'm, you're making me so I think that was happening. But anyway, I think that's a great idea. We have loads of people on fixed income here. And that becomes a burden even to even a $1,000 uh, a concrete job becomes a burden to some budgets. It just, it's, just the way, it's just the way it is. Two-thirds of the people that live in media rent. Yeah, they rent. That's right. Two-thirds of the media. So, so, okay. So, okay. 52%. Thank you very much. So, $800 a year for five years. What's that do to their rent? That might price them out. And I heard some compassionate folks talking about how they were priced out of rents elsewhere. And they came here. That one might happen there that wouldn't be such a great idea uh, the um, the as far as the streets oh, excuse me this the, the trees and the responsibility of the borough I can tell you two trees that are that are going to give trouble pretty quickly and they're right at front and Edgemont one is a sycamore one is a willow oak they've grown tall they hang over they hit the trucks like crazy Wham, wham, wham. So do we have any response? Do we have any liability there if the, if the truck uh, makes a call on our tree whacking their, whacking their truck? So if we could get some opportunity to lift those branches, gosh, that would be great. They're just too high for me to do anymore. I can't get up there anymore. They're just too high. I took care of them as far as I could, but now I can't get them. Concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Martin. All right, anybody else? Motion to adjourn. Wait, so you have to see if I'm Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Did, 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 did we have any uh, any writers in? Sorry, I did. No. Okay. All right, thank you. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes unanimously.